Okay, thank you so much. And thanks for the opportunity to speak uh, at the conference. So let's jump right into it. So just a little bit of uh, intro of what I'm going to talk about. Um, I did write a book called AI First Healthcare, but this talk is not about my book, but I just wanted you to know that there's more background there in terms of um, my vision, my thinking, my point of view on the impact uh, and how AI can be used to make healthcare differently. This conversation that we'll have now, I'd like to focus on, on three basic things. Uh, uh, with some closing thoughts. Uh, just to give some background on AI and large language models and generative AI, you've had a lot of that in the conference so far, so that's great. Uh, then talk about what does it mean to actually be AI first, and then um, talk about the uh, use cases that we're seeing in AI with, uh, you know, some without uh, large language models and some with, and then of course those with generative AI. So that's the nature of our conversation. A little bit more about my background. Uh, as was just stated, I am a director at Google uh, Cloud in the healthcare and life sciences, focused on a variety of things. Um, a lot of my healthcare background was obtained uh, with uh, work I did as a senior vice president uh, at uh, Optum, where I was uh, leading a small R&D group. Prior to that, I uh, was a VP and, and, and did some work in analytics, and the bulk of my career has been at the IBM company. So that's a quick synopsis of who I am. I thought this was useful to just set the stage that uh, clearly we all know about what happened at Dartmouth College in 1956. Uh, there were some pretty significant uh, uh, events that occurred in that uh, time. And for some reason, do I have a, I apologize. I am not looking at the, uh, I am looking at the right deck, but I just jumped out of it because this was not the slide I meant to show to you, but that's okay. Um, Can you move the slide into presentation mode? Yes, I'm going to do that right now. I just jumped out because I saw a potential error in what I had done, but uh, let me just jump ahead here The uh, to show you the full slide. So I'm in presentation mode. Apologize for that hiccup just a moment ago. What I wanted to share with you in this slide is that we did have a profound uh, shift in our thinking around AI around the year 2010. And I would attribute a lot of that to the work that Fei-Fei Li did with ImageNet, uh, which was in 2006, but it really showed us the power of not just crowdsourcing, but the power of being able to use convolution, convolution, convol C CNNs to actually do something powerful with AI, in this case, uh, things like uh, image recognition, facial recognition, and so forth. But we also had another moment uh, with the Google paper that came out in 2017 uh, with Attention is All You Need, which did similarly what uh, Fei-Fei Li and ImageNet did for uh, uh, images, what we've now done for text, uh, what we've done for NLP. So I just wanted to give this uh, uh, sort of historical background, because I do think that there's been a significant shift. And I would uh, say that I did not anticipate a year ago that we would make as much progress as we're now seeing with uh, generative AI. So it's been pretty powerful. But I do want to make this uh, distinction, uh, subtle distinction between large language models and generative AI, because obviously we can use large language models without generating new content, without generative AI. And large language models uh, in the health field have a profound uh, opportunity uh, to uh, to make every experience uh, different. The experience that doctors have with patients, the experience that you have in um, uh, your relationship with your uh, your your provider, your payer, uh, it has a profound impact on. Uh, uh, our ability to do search. So uh, large language models, uh, they, they're just growing uh, dramatically in terms of what they can actually do. So why are they different? Um, one of the reasons they're different is, of course, is because of the um, the large size uh, that we've gone to, uh, you know, just a, a, a few um, parameters uh, to, to trillions of parameters. And it, it, you know, to sort of picture this a moment, if if you go back to this slide for a minute and think about what we were doing with deep learning, uh, well, even before that, you know, we were doing this hard-coded programming, but then with deep learning, we 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 would 
take an image and, and say, is this, is this a cat or is this not a cat? We would do that by training the models, um, by showing them images that have been labeled. Uh, and then pretty soon uh, after it's been trained, it could just answer the question if this is a cat. But now with large language models, what we're doing is we're going to, and we're just giving it this large corpus, this pile of books, you might say, and we're just saying, go read this. And, and then after it's done that, after it's been trained on that, we now say, so you've learned about um, uh, cats and dogs and a ton of other stuff. Tell me, what is a cat? So that's, that's pretty powerful, powerful because now it's generating content, it's generating uh, something new based on what it's been trained on, its corpus, and of course, what we've uh, uh, given it is in terms of a knowledge base. So um, the training data uh, is, uh, you know, is large, uh, and uh, the fact that it can predict what comes next. Uh, the architecture, there's a variety of different architectures used, um, and then the objectives can be different. And I'm gonna focus on the objective of healthcare, medical, and so forth. But the objectives can be, uh, can be wildly different. Um, I think some of the things that we're learning about large language models is that it's not just one model that, that we're gonna have. Uh, it's a myth that there's a single defining model. There's gonna be uh, a variety of different models that will be used. Uh, bigger may, may or may not be better. Um, because um, the models do consume a lot of computing resources and the funding required for companies to create these foundational models uh, is going to uh, incur some costs. And, and we've seen that if, if you've been playing with Dolly or some of the other things, you, or even ChatGPT or, or our Bard, you've seen that some services uh, uh, have to be uh, 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 tempered uh, because of the strain of, of usage. So another reason why the right model for the right job is important. Um, so um, enough said there. So what are large language models that, that, that we're talking about here? So this is just a quick summary um, that um, the large language models can include all types of data modality. It can be video, it can be text, it can be audio. Uh, although a lot of what we're seeing right now is text-based. Uh, but what really distinguishes as, as generative AI is a model that produces content. And I only want to make this point because I think sometimes there's an overlap between um, uh, looking at what we can do with large language models and then generative AI. So they are, I would, I would assert that maybe this is a subtlety, but I would assert that uh, there's use cases for both. Uh, and, and there's use cases when, I mean, uh, obviously, um, uh, generative AI uh, uses uh, large language models, but it, it can use a variety of different architectures. So I hope I'm making sense with that subtlety, just trying to say that uh, uh, that a large language model use case might be different than a generative AI use case. So uh, this is a picture that I think is um, illustrative of what I said, and 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 just, I, I, I think it just really drives home, home the point that the uh, that the uh, model is, is uh, when we talk about generative AI, the fact that we can give it just this large amount of textual data and it can now start answering questions where it in fact is generating new content, whether that's, mute, whether that's a poem, uh, whether that's an essay, uh, or whether that's you know, passing the uh, bar exam. Um, they're different because um, we're now being able to do tasks that were not included in the training sets. That, that sounds a lot more like going from narrow to, uh, to general AI, from weak to strong AI, being able to find patterns uh, and, and be able to uh, you know, just connect. Uh, you know, one of the classic problems that most businesses have, uh, but it's also in healthcare, is I, I want to understand something about my data. So, you know, in the past, uh, the, obviously people have been using a variety of database types. Graph has probably been a, a particular technology that some institutions have used to, to sort of deal with the, uh, the, the wide disparate data sources. But now the opportunity to use large language models and generative AI, where if I fed it my own corporate corpus into this, uh, uh, 
uh, corpus, I can now be able to answer general questions. Uh, and maybe I'll, I'll get some insights that I not would have not otherwise have gotten. So I know I know a lot of our focus has been on the consumer side of generative AI, and I'm sort of focused on the enterprise side of generative AI, where I'm talking about corpuses that would not be open to the general public, but that would be uh, privately maintained within an enterprise, uh, like a payer, uh, someone who provides insurance companies or a provider like a hospital or care, uh, someone who's providing care benefits uh, to, um, to its members, patients, population at large. And of course, this ability uh, to make online interactions uh, conversational is something we see with large language models. And this is even prior to the announcement uh, earlier this year of ChatGPT. Those of you who have played with some of Google technology, you've observed, uh, there's a YouTube video on this. I'm just gonna sort of summarize it. But I, I think it's uh, an, a, amazing when, when I can uh, do more than what I can do with you know, some of the voice assistants, but be able to use Google Assistant and be able to actually say, hey, go make me a reservation uh, for dinner uh, at seven o'clock at blah, blah, blah restaurant. And then I, 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 that's all I do. And then it goes off and, and it, in fact, makes the phone call to the restaurant, has a conversation where it's maintaining context. Uh, and it's it's got the tone of a voice. It self-identifies, that's the ethical part of this, it self-identifies as a bot, but it has that conversation. The person on the other end at the restaurant is talking to the bot as it talks to you and I, and the person on the restaurant is saying, hey, uh, we don't have any reservations available at seven. And the bot understands that, says, well, uh, what times do you have? And it says, well, we have something at eight, and the bot says, that'll be fine. Uh, and uh, it's, it makes a reservation and even says, hey, yeah, you have a good day too. But that's that's what we can do with conversations with large language models. We can make the conversation more human um, and, and, that, and that's a good thing. Um, so this was my point here, is that large language models and generative AI are getting us closer to strong AI. You know, uh, I, I know one of the speakers earlier, which I applaud them for, talked about, I think this was a, a talk yesterday, talked about the fact that, um, uh, you know, that we could pass the Turing test with uh, with uh, generative AI. And I think that's, that's uh, very powerful that we can pass the uh, Turing test, but I don't know if that takes us to strong AI. I would argue uh, that it's insufficient, that maybe the Turing, you know, uh, the Turing test is maybe a little bit uh, of outdated in terms of, uh, of, of being the, uh, uh, the end all and be all of whether or not um, uh, it, it, it's reached this, this level of human understanding. So um, uh, actually, I guess a couple more points I wanted to make here. Um, when we talk about uh, 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 generative AI, I do think in the healthcare field, uh, our opportunities to, to get closer to real-time processing with payment authorizations, our ability to automate the uh, call center to be more conversational, our ability to help uh, patients and members understand medical jargon and medical notes, uh, the notes from the, the actual patient, uh, our ability to, uh, to do better searches and, and to get better responses. Uh, those are all, uh, you know, so we're talking about prior authorizations, we're talking about claims, uh, we're talking about uh, nudges. Uh, these are all opportunities that we have in healthcare. I do think uh, um, uh, Jensen, the CEO of NVIDIA, described uh, generative AI as the iPhone moment. But I do think there's a, a lot of truth in that statement in that what we're looking at uh, is, is probably the most interesting new technology that we've seen in quite some time. More specifically, it's a technology that will change how we um, interface, how we uh, interface with technology. And, and for healthcare, why that's so important is because it's really essential that we make technology invisible versus irresistible. And the more that we can make technology um, transparent, invisible, uh, the more we have an opportunity to lessen physician burnout, 
the more we have an opportunity to lessen the workload on clinicians, the more we have an opportunity to make the technology an aid, a doctor assistant, a physician assistant. I don't see it being a replacement uh, for a variety of reasons, which is not, a, it's not the scope of what I want to talk to you about today. But I do think making um, uh, computers and and technology invisible is our goal in, in healthcare. And, and generative AI is getting us closer to that, to that ballpark. So what do we talk, what do we mean when we talk about uh, an AI first um, uh, uh, company? Uh, when we talk about AI first, um, we're really talking about um, uh, uh, companies that, uh, that really embrace four principles, uh, conversational and sensory, uh, in terms of how they engage, uh, when we talk about devices, whether anything that I can hold becomes ambient, multi-device, we're talking about things that are thoughtful and conceptual, conceptual, contextual, I'm sorry, and, and we're also talking about technology and systems that learn and adapt. So I think when we talk about AI first, it's not that everything we do is AI, it's that we, we look uh, to solve problems uh, in ways that allow us to uh, reduce technical debt, in ways that allow us to create better uh, experiences, a way to allow us to move away from rules-based uh, programming, a way to um, improve efficiency, create new products and services uh, that subscribe, um, have the attributes I just described. They learn and adjust. They're thoughtful. They're contextual. They're ambient. They're multi-device. Multi uh, they're multimodal. They are uh, conversational. So that's uh, that's what I mean. Uh, the second point here is that um, the artificial intelligence does become the foundation uh, of a company's products. I do think that generative AI, um, another benefit that it is having as a technology, is it will help uh, those organizations. Um, who have been uh, uh, not as strong in AI get there faster. It'll help them get there faster because of um, uh, the more democratization that we're seeing. Uh, they won't have to, um, uh, they, they will be able to use services from many of the technology vendors out of the box, whether they're APIs, whether they're products um, and so forth. So, and there's a lot of challenges to being AI first. Uh, and I won't deny that those challenges are multifaceted in terms of uh, staffing, in terms of uh, 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 the ethics uh, and so forth. So companies that are that are looking to, uh, you know, to do this uh, uh, are going to have have to address that from an enterprise standpoint, um, you know, companies and we're seeing this already where companies in, in the financial markets have already disallowed the use of of chat GPT in, in, the, in the enterprise scope. And the reason for that is they don't want their partic particular proprietary information to be released or, or whatever. So, uh, so companies do have to think, how do they keep their information private and factual? Um, how do I manage who ask questions of my models and at what level? Um, and, and this is gonna be true in healthcare at all. So I don't think uh, there's, there's things that organizations are gonna have to manage. So I, I think we're now moving, uh, I think educators are seeing this and that, um, you know, we're going to have to start understanding better how to ask the right questions. So um, from a healthcare standpoint, I think AI first does mean that healthcare organizations will use AI to do three basic things, uh, quality of care, uh, reducing costs and making healthcare more accessible. So I'm going to get into the quality of care and, and how I think that could come about. Um, before I get there, uh, some use cases I think that uh, uh, that that are here and on the horizon. Uh, one is around personalized medicine, uh, the ability uh, to actually uh, make this about you. I think we'll see that with concepts like digital twins that will start emerging. We've already seen those in other industries like manufacturing, but I think now with generative AI, we'll see this ability to actually make digital twins, which become replicas of you and I uh, from a healthcare standpoint, where perhaps even on my phone, I have this uh, digital twin that can in effect um, uh, uh, represent my 
uh, physical, uh, uh, digitally, of course, represent who I am, knows my weight, knows my uh, clinical data in terms of A1C, uh, glucose, uh, uh, it knows some of my genomic data. Uh, but the, the point is, it can now start doing predictive uh, types of things to determine whether or not uh, if I go on the same course and pace, maybe I'm maybe I've been picking up weight five pounds a year for the last five years. Maybe my A1C has been rising gradually by 0.7 every year. And it could start predicting, you know, that you have a higher chance of type 2 diabetes because of your uh, genetic background, because of your uh, current physiology and the current trends. We would suggest you do these five things, or I can go ask my gender to, I'm sorry, I can go ask my digital twin uh, these questions and it could start answering it. So I do think uh, medicine can become, become more personalized. Uh, from a predictive standpoint, um, you've seen this already with uh, Google Workspace. You've seen it with Microsoft where now I can go into a spreadsheet and 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 just ask it to, hey, help me understand X, Y, and Z. Tell me what this means without having to understand all the complexities of that data. So the same can be true with medical data. So I can predict the future health of patients. Uh, we can do that today, but I can do it better. Um, uh, and with virtual assistants, I've sort of talked about that already, but this ability to uh, uh, to actually have a conversation. I mean, think about um, if, if I were a doctor, in, and we saw this with COVID, uh, during the days of COVID, where doctors, um, in some cases, were making medical mistakes uh, uh, for a variety of reasons, but medical mistakes are, are made quite a, a bit in the in this field more than we we need to. But what if they had a digital assistant in their ear at all times, where they could just ask it a question um, uh, in and making even making that even more specific? And then with drug discovery, the ability to to use uh, and create synthetic data with generative data, uh, uh, and to be able to to use that to create new drugs, and with clinical trials. Um, uh, be able to uh, help um, identify those patients at risk, and of course, uh, the ability to do better di diagnostics. So uh, some other use cases you see here, um, uh, and, and again, I'm not going to bore you with these, but I, I just wanted to put this visually for you. Uh, but all of these use cases, uh, whether it's speech, whether it's visual to detect uh, behavioral disorders, whether those disorders, disorders are um, uh, the onset of on, 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 Alzheimer's or the uh, uh, depression. Uh, these are things that we're going to be able to do more of and, and in the real-time monitoring. So we can now uh, also begin to see uh, the ability uh, to have these virtual case managers, clinical office managers that, uh, that we didn't have before. I wanted to, to walk you through this example uh, this is an example I illustrated in the book that I wrote, AI First Healthcare, but I think it gives an example of, of how AI can become the microscope of the future. So this is a real story. My sister-in-law uh, is a type uh, one diabetic, uh, but before she became diabetic, she became diabetic in, in the latter part of her, uh, I mean, she's still a, a fairly young woman in her 40s, uh, but she became a diabetic uh, much earlier than that, and she didn't feed she didn't meet the attributes of a, of a diabetic. She's in great shape. She exercises regularly. She's young, uh, a thin frame, uh, athletic frame. So uh, no history of diabetes in the family. Uh, so she didn't meet any of the um, check marks of someone who has diabetes, but she was feeling uh, tired and her, her state of well-being was in a decline. So she calls up her doctor and uh, they do blood tests and and a bunch of stuff, but they diagnosed her as diagnosed her as a type two diabetic. And the treatment for a type one versus type two is just radically different in terms of how you manage insulin levels. So what they were doing for her as a type two was in effect killing her. And she, um, uh, uh, you know, her. Anyway, long story, she she did get the right diagnosis. So this picture is about how could we have stopped that? So what I'm what I'm imagining in a future state with generative AI and with AI is that Bethany, the, the, the person in question, now has this digital twin, which is an app on her phone. And, um, and now she's got these symptoms that 
Uh, and she's talking with her doctor too. I'm not suggesting to remove the doctor out of the equation at all, but I'm saying we're putting into the arms of Bethany and hopefully the doctor as well, better tools. So Bethany now can ask her uh, app, you know, I'm feeling blah, 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 blah. And, and the app would say, you know, I, it, it could tell her perhaps, I think you have type one diabetes. So that's what it does in the background uh, because it's getting all of these uh, data. And, and now she can have a better conversation with her doctor. And also uh, her doctor is now receiving, uh, as, as this technology evolves and, and gets embraced, uh, uh, and, and the twin advised her to run these particular blood tests for autoantibodies that are common to type one. The doctor does this. Uh, she uses, uh, whether it's a virtual uh, consultation, but things go right as a result. So that's why I talk about AI, AI becoming the microscope of the future. So I do think with generative AI, uh, we're going to see even uh, more um, uh, good use cases with patient consumer engagement, clinical and care team support, and research and development. i am uh, uh, just got a few minutes left here, but I, 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 I hope I've given you a perspective uh, and I don't see a reason to distinguish between large language models and generative AI in terms of use cases, but I made the distinction here just so we can see that generative AI is doing even more than what we could do with large language models in isolation. So uh, this patient consumer engagement is really the one that I think is huge in terms of being able to have um, uh, not just a search, which I do with Google search or whatever today, but the ability to actually have a Q&A that's contextual, uh, to be able to have my lab reports uh, be part of the conversation. So this would be something that the provider, whether it's a hospital or care center, whoever, uh, or um, uh, 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 a large healthcare organization, this would be something they'd have to realize as a tool. Uh, and then when we look at the clinical care and team support, uh, they too would have these same tools. Uh, these tools, just as the, the simple one I, I, I gave you in terms of making a, um, uh, a uh, appointment for a restaurant, of course, we can do this in terms of, of scheduling doctor appointments and and uh, and also uh, creating, uh, you know, providers will be able to create uh, educational content. Uh, my ability to, uh, you know, maybe maybe I've taken the recording uh, because uh, my doctor gave me permission to do this one, and this is especially true of of, of of certain types of patients or all patients where I've 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 got the notes from the doctor office. And how many times we've we been in the situation where your wife or your or your or a person's parents are accompanying them to the doctor or vice versa, the kid accompanying the parent, and they're there because they're the note taker, they're the the second pair of eyes. But now not only can I be the second pair of eyes, but I can take my notes and I can now use generative AI to give me uh, maybe things I, I didn't quite fully understand if for whatever, whatever whatever reason didn't have the uh, the uh, the moment to to ask the question at that time. So some closing thoughts. Uh, I do think the delivery of care uh, has to continue to be transparent. Uh, so people should know when they're talking to things like a bot, but uh, I do think systems uh, like uh, like claims and prior authorizations that sit in the background should operate like other industries in near real time. Uh, and I do think that, uh, as I said before, technology must be ever present, but invisible. And, and that's our goal. So with that said, uh, I think that we can move from where we are today to this personalized, frictionless, always on, precision medicine, price transparency. And uh, I thought uh, uh, some good readings for you, uh, for those interested to, uh, uh, to maybe uh, learn more about generative AI, but uh, uh, some good papers. Uh, attention is all you need is, as I said, is the paper that is the basis for, for what we're seeing with, uh, with generative AI on the textual side uh, and so forth. So with that said, um, I think I've concluded. Uh, you can definitely uh, uh, tweet tweet me and, uh, and and so forth. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing. Uh, well, actually I'll keep sharing, but I do have my video on at this point.